Welcome back everyone to the Psychology Capstone Showcase. Um, I hope you had a nice break. Um, right now we're gonna move into the second half of the day with our presentations that have a live component to it. So our first presentation is from one of our undergraduate students, Brittany Irby Pruitt, who is going to be presenting on racial bias in the classroom. This is gonna be a video presentation followed by a live Q&A and Brittany is here uh, joining us. You can wave, Brittany. <laughs> there she is. Um, so we'll return back to this room after the video is over and feel free to ask Brittany questions. If you wanna post some of your questions in the chat, you're more than welcome to do that. Or at the end of the presentation, you can use the raise hand feature and then we'll unmute you so you can ask your question. Thank you so much. Hello everyone, my name is Brittany Irby Pruitt and today we will be discussing the presence of socioeconomic status and racial bias in the classroom. I became passionate about this topic in my personal life as I worked with children across different racial and socioeconomic lines. In marginalized communities, I saw a huge disparity in child to teacher ratios, inadequate classroom support, and lack of teaching experience, which impacted classroom management. My focus has always been education and social services. So over the past decade, I've had the privilege to work as an early childhood program director, early childhood teacher. I've traveled to South Africa to provide educational access in local townships. And I currently work in Brooklyn as a behavioral specialist. A huge factor that impacted my teaching and resources in high needs, low income communities was money. Quick socioeconomic fact. The annual median net worth of African-American families is approximately $42,000. 43% of those families are earning less than $30,000 annually. The annual median net worth of white American families is $188,000. A family's socioeconomic status impacts their accessibility in the world and determines their access to education including higher education, healthcare, housing, and overall well-being. If black families earn one eighth of a white family's wealth annually, how can they have access to quality education programs or higher education? According to a 2019 report by the New York City's Comptroller's Office, the average cost of an early childhood program for infants to 18 months costs $2,600, and for children 18 to 24 months old, the cost was at least $16,000. If Black Americans are earning less than $30,000 annually, it makes sense why a child's academic achievement may be lower than their white counterparts who have been in school since infancy. Educational redlining and racial bias impact African Americans financially and academically, which limits access to the world around them. The discriminatory practice of educational redlining hinders families of color access to quality educational programs, which in turn impacts their academic achievement when they enter school. The financial impact on local schools. Redlining is a practice in the United States that legally allowed for racial discrimination in the housing market against communities of color, which resulted in the disinvestment in Black communities. The Federal Home Owners Loan Corporation and Federal Housing Administration, the FHA, drew red lines around neighborhoods that were considered unsavory to grant mortgages to from 1934 to 1968. Lenders and bankers Lenders and bankers refused to build homes in these communities and approve loans for mortgages. The loans were refused based solely on the applicant's racial identity. Although this practice is technically illegal today, black and brown communities are still feeling the ripple effects of these racist and biased policies. The effects of these federal policies left lasting impacts on where people could live, creating geographic concentrations of lower income families and fueling suburban growth for higher income families. 
The National Child Research Center confirmed that most cities that were impacted by redlining over 80 years ago are still being impacted by educational redlining today. Systematically, school funding, funding is impacted by property taxes, meaning the higher taxes a community pays, the better the resources. Board members and stakeholders impact the decisions regarding zoning in neighborhoods and often within their own communities. White and affluent families are dominant actors in school boundary and rezoning efforts, often seeking to influence the process to their advantage. White and affluent families are highly involved in zoning debates and are curious to know how re-examining school zones will impact the schools and neighborhoods where they reside. How does redlining exactly impact schools and organiza school organizations? Studies revealed that upper middle class and affluent families not only had more money, but also more time to invest. Due to the parents' financial wealth and flexibility in work schedules, they were able to devote more time to public hearings, attend parent-teacher organization meetings, network, launch neighborhood initiatives, and schedule meetings with local city officials and parent members. So when affluent parents join the PTO and provide financial resources and networks for schools, their voices are generally valued more. Why? Because of money, privilege, and power. Money equals power. When white families are determined to be front and center of decision making, and school boards are not racially inclusive, it creates the narrative that white and affluent people will always be in positions of power and people of color become farther marginalized. The ideas that are being presented or changes that are, being, being, that are taking place on the PTO may not be in the best interest of the school community as a whole and especially black communities. A study by Heidemann 2012 discovered undeserved, unserved families often engage less in school involvement due to perceived language or racial barriers. Furthermore, family characteristics such as parent emotional or mental health challenges, stress or depression can negatively impact family engagement. Compared to white families, families of color may be experiencing higher levels of stress and anxiety due to day-to-day -day life and tension within the school community. Due to racial bias and unfair treatment of Black scholars, parents of color are more likely to receive a phone call about their child's challenging behavior or possible expulsion. The excessive and discriminatory policing of Black children can impact their parents' view of their child's academic potential. Despite the student body becoming more ethnically and racially diverse, it is also becoming more segregated. School segregation is driven by a person's zip code, accessibility to financial resources, and ethnic identity, which creates educational inequality. According to the U.S. Government Accountability Office, more than a third of students, about 18.5 million of them, attended a predominantly same race ethnicity school during the 2021 school year. And 14% of students attended schools where almost all of the student body was of a single race or ethnicity. A study conducted by Holmes 2012 discovered that white upper middle class families chose schools for their children based on their network beliefs in the schools and if they were considered good or bad. The schools that were considered bad were more ethnically diverse and had families from a lower socioeconomic status. 
Despite a growing population of a racially diverse student population, the National Center for Educational Statistics revealed that eight in 10 public school teachers, approximately 79%, identi identified as non-Hispanic white during the 2017-2018 school year. Lack of socioeconomic resources impacts the student's achievement. Poverty impacts a scholar's ability to succeed in school. Children who are born into poverty are twice as likely to drop out of school. A study revealed that Black children were more likely to live in single parent homes, live in extreme poverty, and attend more disadvantaged schools. There is also an evident achievement gap by kindergarten amongst Black and white students in cognitive functions, reading, and math skills. Research shows that a child's lack of school readiness entering kindergarten can be an indicator of later academic troubles and leave them in a compromising position. Educational redlining and racial bias impacts academic and student performance, school funding, student diversity, and racial segregation throughout communities. Poverty's impact on academic achievement. Schools with higher levels of student, student poverty and a larger percentage of students of color are taught by less experienced teachers Students have lower academic achievement, higher levels of teacher turnover, higher dropout rates, and fewer students attending college. The NCEDL sweep study, which included 11 states that served over 80% of the US preschool population in 2001-2002, found that Black and Latino children attended programs of lower average quality than white children. Despite well-meaning intentions, implicit and racial bias can creep into classrooms and school cultures, impacting relations, relationships between staff, students, and parents. Racial bias in the classroom. What is racial bias? Racial bias is defined as a personal and unreasoned judgment based solely on an individual's race. By the time children enter elementary school, research shows there is a widespread racial discrimination affecting children of color. Racial bias impacts a student's connection with their educators, their academic achievement, school engagement, and creates an imbalance of negative versus positive interactions with staff. Implicit bias is very dangerous in education because educators and administration are not conscious of how their limiting beliefs may be impacting their day-to-day -day interactions with scholars. Studies reveal that implicit biases can be formed by subtle behaviors or cues that educators witness from scholars of color. Most young children of color do not have the words to describe what bias or racism specifically is, but the feeling and imprint of those negative actions or biased comments can imprint for a lifetime. Research shows children of color can detect bias and negative expectation, expectations of them. For example, teachers may assume that students with an accent may have poor comprehension or writing skills. Students in a particular marginalized group may be treated as the voice or expert for that marginalized group or there may be an assumption of a group's learning style, how girls versus boys learn, different learning styles amongst ethnic groups. These biases can also influence how a teacher grades a student, who they are more willing to help, their imbalance of praising a student versus reprimanding them, and so much more. Walter Gillum, a researcher at Yale Child Study Center, wanted to examine teachers' experience of detecting challenging behavior in the classroom. 
However, his main focus was examining implicit bias amongst educators. Gillum understood that implicit biases could be formed by subtle behaviors or cues that highlight how assumptions could quickly formulate in the psyche. At a preschool annual conference, 135 educators were read a prompt where they were asked to identify challenging behaviors in the video. Each video contained four children, one black boy, one black girl, a white boy, and a white girl. Gillum deceived the participants by telling them there may or may not be challenging behavior when in fact there wasn't any in the video. In the script that he read to educators, he stated that it is important to notice behaviors before they become more problematic in the classroom. Teachers were asked to press the enter button every time they witnessed challenging behaviors. The study revealed that overall teachers track black students more and disproportionately black boys. Gillum believed this shed light on high rates of expulsion of black children. This served for educators a confirmation bias that black children were more unruly and in fact, educators were unconsciously expecting black children to exhibit challenging behaviors in the classroom. When participants were asked to rate the challenging behavior, they rated 42% identified the black boy, 34% identified the white boy, while 13% and 10% identified the white and black girls respectfully. Studies stated that black students are four times as likely to be suspended as white students and nearly twice as likely to be expelled. Black preschoolers are 3.6 times more likely to receive one or more out of school suspensions. Sometimes educators are unaware of their adultification of black children. Studies also show teachers perceived black boys as more aggressive and black girls as more angry during everyday interactions. In these early formative years, as children are learning about their self identity, racial bias can erode a black child's self esteem and increase internalized racism. When marginalized groups receive negative images, expectations, and interactions with adults, they may accept negative, negative messages as a mirror to their self-worth and acceptance in the world. Remedies based on psychology findings. Based on my research and findings in the field of psychology, my solutions focus on the importance of warm and predictable relationships at home and in school, the value of inclusion, socioeconomic temperaments of social emotional temperaments of educators, and the negative impact of systemic racism. Segregation is a huge part of the issues in schools. Although educational redlining and segregation are technically illegal today, the effects of these policies are still lingering in school. As stated earlier, despite the increase in ethnic diversity amongst the student population, the teacher population is a huge majority of white women as educators and administration. One way to combat this issue would be integration. We live in a diverse world, not just in regards to racial identity, but also politics, religion, gender, sexual orientation, and so much more. It is evident that people like to gravitate towards their comfort zone in regards to race, culture, and customs. In schools and throughout life, this has the potential to leave parents and children narrow-minded and seeking out confirmation biases of what they deem to be true of other cultures. This further drives the negative cycle of bias and racist attitudes that manifest due to lack of exposure of diverse life experiences and children who grow up claiming to be colorblind or do not see systematic racism as a real issue. Integration also needs to happen in regards to the racial makeup of administration and teachers. 
Students should see educators that look like them and others that look different from them. There needs to be a conscious effort to hire more black and brown educators to create more equity among staff. This could be great representation for students of color to create positive relationships with teacher that have the same culture and racial identity. It has the potential to promote more positive self-awareness, help parents to see the attempts of equity and encourage them to connect more with the school community and be involved more in decision-making. White students could also learn about the cultures around them and experiences that may be similar or different from their own. In regards to teaching experiences, technically, typically in more urban settings, they receive more novel teachers. The teacher's years of experience and educational credentials should also be considered. There needs to be a fair distribution of qualified teachers across community lines. In order to fight for equity of resources, there should not be any borders or red lines prohibiting a scholar from accessing a better education. If there was an integration or diversity threshold, it would allow students of color access to resources that are typically reserved for upper middle class and white families. The same equity among staff and PTO members would be mandatory for students. Suburban schools should also integrate and welcome with open arms students that may have a different racial identity from them and exchange life experiences and promote within the school equity, equity amongst races and resources. In order to close the achievement gap, this would be the expectation across the country, starting from infancy in schools. There should be a focus on quality school and home-based school readiness programs in urban and rural communities to help close the achievement gap. If for any reason across the country, these percentages were not being met in regards to racial equity, that will warrant meetings, reviews of educational policies, and anti-racist and bias trainings, depending on the racial makeup and percentage in a specific state and city. The country could also employ local culture teams that would meet with schools regarding their progress to undo racism quarterly. Leading for racial e equity and components of social justice would be uniform principles throughout schools in the United States. These principles will be discussed and praised from infancy and the importance of treating others with kindness, respect, and overall love for all human beings. The city and state would mandate going around to schools to score them on their intentionality about inclusion and leading for racial equity. All schools would need to commit to at least one Friday per month during professional development that addresses racial bias and the impact of these behaviors in the classrooms. On a state and local level, they will provide workbooks, guided questions, suggested readings, classroom materials, guidance on equity and PTO involvement, and ways to bridge the connection between child, teacher, and the home. Understanding how important parents are to their child's academic success, Teachers and administration will also make weekly calls home, uh, not just about behavioral issues, but about strengths that they witness with the child and generally to check in and build a rapport with each and every family. These phone calls don't have to be lengthy in time, but they do need to be genuine and serve as a way to highlight the child and build rapport with parents. Schools will focus on restorative practices and conversations if students did feel like they witnessed or were a victim of racial or implicit bias. Conversations about ra racial bias and racism would not be shunned, but would be openly discussed and warmly welcomed. Equity, inclusion for all students, staff, parents, and families. Thank you so much, Brittany, for your video presentation. I want to open it up to the wider audience to see if people had comments or questions. If so, please use the raise hand feature and we can unmute you. Well, I'll go ahead and start off. Um, Brittany, 
can you talk a little bit about how you came to be interested in this topic and also really what the journey was for you, how this process um, and the project kind of evolved over the course of the semester? Um, so I guess similarly, I always knew that this was the route that I wanted to take um, for the senior capstone. Um, it's something that I'm super passionate about. As I said, I've worked in like affluent families, um, worked with them and in schools um, for early childhood. And now I'm working in East New York and Brooklyn where most of the families receive um, free lunch or subsidized lunch. Um, prior to this, I was working on the Upper West Side where parents were investing at minimally $3,000 a month for early childhood services. Um, so as soon as I made the switch over and just in my personal life too, I attended public and private schools. So as a kid, I always knew that something was different, but I never quite had like the education or the wording to put my finger on it. Um, so once I started my bachelor's degree and started learning all the buzzwords like redlining and racial injustice and equity, I was like, ding, 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 ding. Like, this is what I felt like as a kid, but I just didn't have the verbiage or I didn't have the tools to actually go out and research, right? And like feel validated in my experience that this is real. Like this isn't something that I'm making up. There's studies on top of studies on top of studies and research that validates my experience as a little brown girl navigating public and private school. Um, so as soon as I knew that I had the opportunity to choose a topic, I knew for sure that this was it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brittany. Um, Solange asked, you know, where did you begin your research? You know, how did you choose your sources? What was that like? Um, so that was kind of difficult, honestly. I ran into just, you know, like you want to do quick Google searches. Okay, what comes up? Um, but obviously a lot of those weren't scholarly articles. So immediately I just reached out to my professor. I'm like, hey, I know that you know, my opinion weighs a lot on this paper. I don't want that to make the paper sound biased or not credible, like what should I do? Um, so I immediately went to her and she was like, okay, like start at these databases, go to OneSearch, make sure you look. They have to be peer reviewed articles, you know, try not to be biased, take a step back. What does the data look like? Do you feel like this, um, you know, like takes a neutral stance, like what's the stance of the writer, what's the purpose of it. Um, so that was a whole journey within itself. Um, so, you know, just taking it day by day. And again, just always leaning in on your professor and admin to get a second eye or second opinion on the sources as well. Great. Thanks, Brittany. And thanks for the question, Solange. Other questions? I mean, Brittany, was there anything that surprised you? I mean, I know that you had a lot of experience with this as you've talked about, but you know, was there anything that, that you were surprised to learn? And if so, you know, what was it? I think the biggest surprise was I never really considered the way that PTOs and PTAs shape local schools. Um, I just knew from my experience, like I always felt jaded, like, oh, well, my parents can't be at those meetings, you know, or like they're not the parent volunteers who are in classroom. And quite frankly, most brown and black people that I knew, their parents weren't there. And I think, you know, as kids, we would be like, oh, like they need to take time off work or, you know, Chelsea's mom is there, or so-and-so mom is there. So you would feel like your parents were less invested or, you know, like their job should be more flexible or all of these questions that you have as kids, right? Like you're just trying to make sense of the conversation. Um, and then once I looked at the pay disparity, I was like, ding, 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 that's it. Like my mom didn't have the flexibility at work. She couldn't afford to take a few days off a month, right, to sit into the classroom to volunteer. I'm sure if she could, she would, but she was paying for private school. She wasn't making that much money. She had two kids that, you know, she needed to support. Whereas for some of my other um, cohorts who were white affluent families, your father is a doctor or your mom is already working from home or, you know, she has more of a flexible schedule or she's a consultant. Like all of these words and occupations, I didn't quite understand. Um, so the research just kind of gave me a fresh lens about, whoa, like, again, these conversations that I had with my friends as kids, thinking that your parents didn't care. It wasn't that. It's money wise. They, they may not be able to do it. And then how that also like reiterates this negative connotation 
that you would hear also amongst teachers, right? That black parents aren't as invested and you would internalize that message and think, oh, well, maybe my education isn't as important, right? Or no one really cares how I, how I do in school um, when it should have been taught then and said then, you know, there isn't equity amongst families. And some families can afford to do this and some can't. And all of your parents care about you. It's not a matter that they're not invested in your education. Some work schedules look differently. So now that I'm in education, that's something that I try to hone in on and let you know scholars know just because your parents aren't here, they couldn't make it to a meeting. It doesn't mean that they don't care, right? They just may have a different life circumstance that prevented them from coming today. No, that's great. I think those are really great points. You know, Blake uh, in the chat was saying that she really appreciated the in-depth focus on the layers of racism that affect the classroom setting and how you set this set of action steps for teachers um, to have a positive psychological effect on their students. And she asked the question, do you think the new access with COVID via virtual meetings can help with the engagement um, of parents of color? I think that that can be a tipping point. But I think, too, we have to be mindful, again, right, of the layers of poverty and access. So that's already with the assumption that people have Wi-Fi at home, that they have access to a working iPhone or some high-tech gadget to where they can, can connect to Zoom. That's not realistic for some families. Some of the families that I work with ask their teachers if they can bring a laptop home because the families can't afford it. To you and I, we may not think twice about buying a MacBook for $1,200 or you know whatever the case may be, but when you have two or three kids at home or in, even a mom who's a single in a single parent home, how can you justify spending hundreds of dollars on a piece of technology? It just may not be in the budget and it may not be feasible. So again, I think that's something that we have to consider in regards to equity. Um, and we just can't assume that everyone has access to the things that we don't think twice about. I mean, I think we see it at SPS, right? We have students who um, do a lot of their work on their phones um, because they, they can't afford um, computers. We have a lot of students who go to McDonald's because there's free Wi-Fi connection there. So I think, you know, we're seeing that all throughout the educational um, levels. Um, oh, I see George Audi is here. Uh, George, you had a question? I mean, this is fascinating uh, and, and and also in, in some ways sort of overwhelming because you were so good, Brittany, at the, at the beginning about noting all of the disadvantages, all of the inequities. Um, and it reminded me, I don't know how many, it's kind of old now, it's like five years old. But there's this YouTube, I just put the URL in the, the chat that invites everybody to, in a race, to line up and then tells the people with certain socioeconomic advantages to advance 10 yards, 20 yards, maybe even 50 yards, uh, and those with disadvantages to hobble themselves and how they can only race on one leg, for instance, and something like that. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's entertaining more than it is real data, but it, it also indicates how much the, the issues of, of student agency, parent agency, and so on are complicated from the very beginning by these inequities. And so, you know, it was it was uh, very encouraging of you to, to take this multi-pronged approach, but I have to ask, this is partly because what I saw in the New York Times this morning, you know, book bannings and things like that are up. Um, you know, we used to, uh, uh, to depend on on a sense of, of sort of progress and right-mindedness on the part of the world. And we've got things going on now where whole states, happily, New York right now isn't one of them, but you know, in Tennessee, they they banned certain books and at, at the school board level, and it went all the way to the state legislature, which was endorsed, um, endorsing the, the decision. Those books were not reinstated. Um, this is a special problem for all sorts of things. The particular example there was anti-Semitism and the banning of Mouse, which is this wonderful graphic novel of uh, the Holocaust, how much this is hurting the LGBTQ community, um, but above all, how, how much it, it disadvantages people of, of color. And, uh, I, you know, I just, I, I wonder to some extent how you 
you manage this in, especially, you know, working with educators as well as students uh, and, and holding despair at bay. Like, how much can I do? This is a huge question of agency, of the power of human will and, and determination. Um, the odds are against you, and sometimes even there's this, what de Tocco called the tyranny, tyranny of the majority. You know, um, I think of, about the difference. I have colleagues in uh, places like Florida and Texas who feel very differently about their the capacity for success. Um, so it's a huge question. It might might be more than one, but um, I wanted to ask. So I guess so. You were cutting out a little bit, so I oh. don't know if I capture everything. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to hone in on, um, I think your main point of banning books, right? And like, where does that lie in academic settings? Um, I'm not for banned books. Um, as a person who is marginalized in many ways, I'm queer, I'm Black, I'm femme, right? And I have all of these identities. I feel like it's important to dissect academic books, even when we don't agree. I think that there's power in that. I do think that in academic settings and in regards to being an educator, though, we have to do so with intention and purpose. As a person of color, I feel like a lot of times we are set in a disadvantage um, because not everything is taught about our history, right, and the power of being a person of color. So that's something that I had to learn from my family, from my friends, and just as life went on. So I think that you have to be really intentional, right? Like if we're talking about people who are Jewish or people who are queer or people who are disabled or people who are black or Hispanic or whatever, what's the takeaway? What's the narrative that we want students to walk away with? And I feel like a lot of times it gets misconstrued as, oh, these are just you know marginalized people. They were oppressed, right? They were slaves, they were this, they were that. But aside from that, is also a whole nother lens that I feel like a lot of times, at least I can speak, you know, in regards to America, those things are untouched. We also don't hear about Black victories, right, or the ways that we positively impacted the community and the country. We don't talk about who built the White House, right, <laughs> and, and our own country. We don't talk about Black Wall Street and how that was burnt down when people of color were actually thriving and you know, combating, um, redlining, and all of these different things. So again, I'm not for banning books, but I think we have to, whatever we teach, we're doing it with intention, and also realizing that we have children from all over the world, and how are we adequately portraying their history? I don't know the answer to that. I think it's a lot of work, but again, I feel like, you know, signing up to be an educator, that's, that's the point, right? we have to be intentional about what the students are walking away with. And if the message accurately portrays um, marginalized communities. George, I think, I mean, you're, it sounds like you're, you were also asking Brittany, or maybe I, I misunderstood, but about what, like how it was doing this project at this particular point in time, was that also what you were kind of thinking about? Yes. I mean, we're living in a very interesting <laughs> yeah. time where, you know, people's voices are being silenced and anti-Semitism is on the rise and, you know, all of these things are happening. And then you're doing this project about racism in, in a classroom. And, you know, were, were you thinking about that as you were doing the project? I don't know if oh, I necessarily. I, uh, yeah. Sorry. No, it's okay. I don't know if I necessarily like hyper focus on that because the reality is this is my experience every day. So every year since I've been born, right, it's been a different story or a different victim or a different event that has happened and like all of this trauma that you have to process. Um, so no, I just feel like this project came because it, like I said, it's been my everyday experience since being in elementary school, going to a Catholic school, and then my family not being able to afford it anymore, and then going to a public school, and then going back to a Catholic school, and just seeing the disparity, but not knowing what it meant. Um, so now at like the pinnacle, right, of like my bachelor's degree, it only made sense that 
looking back, all of those experiences it shaped, shaped my today. Thanks, Brittany. George, did you want to add something? I know you, you, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I, I was just, I, be, I would, because I was too all over the place and part of the, sorry for the sirens now. Um, part of the problem is that there is so much to deal with, but, uh, you know, one of the things clearly is the reaction against in, in certain states, the, the, the so-called 1619 project, um, you know, arguments about what students get taught, um, so-called uh, the silencing of discussion of, of um, uh, gayness and, and queerness in, in the state of Florida, for instance, in the public system. It's, there's so much that, uh, um, is sort of invites a kind of uh, um, almost a surrender on the part of, of uh, people who ought to be responsible. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking of school boards and and uh, and taxpayers, you know, ultimately because it's it, 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 these systems are accountable to them. And I, you know, I I have for a long time, you know, as raising kids and and now grandkids had the sense that we were getting somewhere, that it was, you know, maybe two steps forward, one step back. But it's harder, I think, these days to feel that way. Um, and I don't think it's the pandemic. Um, I, I think a lot of it has to do with the political climate and uh, sort of re refocused to some extent um, in recent days uh, because of the, you know, January 6 trials and so on. And I don't think, uh, We've entirely reckoned with this in the educational sphere, what this means about what we should teach and what we should be upfront about and what we can't teach. And I don't have answers. I just, I realized that uh, things I thought were moving towards solutions are harder than they've ever been. Other questions or comments, Brittany? No, I think just to like close up, um, like what you were saying, like rectifying what to teach in schools. I think the biggest thing for me, again, as a person of color and my experience, I, what I was trying to get at was teaching the truth. I think a lot of the times we shy away from <clears throat> um, slavery and who it was beneficial for, how that impacted communities of color and still continues to impact communities of color. And like I was saying too, all of the attribute, all of the accomplishments from people of color. I felt like as a child, I had to wait until February, right? It was a few days in Black History Month. And then it was like, okay, like let's go round and round and like shout out the traditional five people. And it's like, okay, we're gonna talk about um, Martin Luther King Jr. We're gonna talk about Rosa Parks. And it was like year after year after year after year. And I think again, as a country, we just have to be, realistic <laughs> like what happened what is still happening how are we here how do we fix it but again we can't get to that point if we're still arguing about the impact of slavery we cannot get there if we're saying oh educational redlining is over Pfft, that was years ago we've been said it was legal but it's like no like let's look at the data because we love to look at it about everything else and mm -hmm. realistically have a conversation about how this is still impacting marginalized communities. Again, if we're going to teach about slavery, if we're gonna teach about bias, then let's get into the nitty gritty and really talk about it. And I feel like overall, and granted, I don't have you know the research or the studies to show, but I'm sure most families of color would warmly welcome that. So I'm just interested in who the pushback would be from, right, in regards to these topics and why. And that's something that needs to be explored. Well, that's, that's interesting because uh... That's one of the questions I mean was talking was asking about what your thoughts were about navigating potential resistance, you know, on the part of educators or the part of all of us um, when it comes to doing the inner work that needs to be done to combat all the things that you've highlighted. So do you have any thoughts about how someone or we can navigate, you know, potential resistance? Um, I feel like with great change always comes resistance. I don't want to work out. Um, I need to. But with that change comes resistance, eating habits, working out, talking about racism, talking about bias. I don't think that any of these things, I never assumed that they would come easily. We look at our history throughout the United States, right? And in order for change to come, it came at a huge cost 
Um, and that's something that's always at the forefront of my mind. You know, my great grandmother was born in 1923 in Georgia. So these are conversations that I had to have young as a child around the dinner table. Like another presenter said um, with, you know, our white counterparts, typically you don't have conversations about what it looks like if you're stopped by the police. I was told very young as a child what the protocol was to make sure I wasn't seen as a threat and things of those of that nature. So again, people have to be uncomfortable to be comfortable. My job is not to make sure that you are comfortable or there isn't any resistance because then change won't come. I think people have to be realistic with themselves. You're a human being. If we're all in the psych department, we all know that we have biases, whether you're yellow, black, brown, or white. So again, you have to be uncomfortable to dismantle and have those hard conversations. Otherwise, we'll be in the same position that we are now in terms of racial tensions and racial biases 50 years from now. Right. And performative solutions, right? Just, you know, nothing real of substance happening. Um, right. Dr. Alicia, I'll, I'm going to pass it to you for our last question um, for Brittany. Um, so, Brittany, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, fantastic job. And you brought up a lot of um, very important issues um, that are very relevant. Uh, I don't think we talk enough about the impact of socioeconomic status and how it is entangled with ethnicity uh, and race to the point where we can't necessarily separate them. Um, we do a lot of acknowledging uh, of racism, again, performatively sometimes, but we don't acknowledge the impact of um, classism and of economic inequality and what that does to a child's experience. Uh, we don't talk about it when it comes to white people. We don't talk about it when it comes to um, black people. We don't talk about it when it comes to Latinos, and we don't talk about it when it comes to most groups, period. And Asian Americans mm -hmm. and, uh, very often are you know, excluded from conversations about socioeconomics, even though um, they have greater levels of inequality. Now you've done all this work and the capstone is over, um, but obviously this is something you're very passionate about. So I wanted to ask you what comes next? What do you plan on using this new knowledge that you have? Uh, how do you plan on you for what you, what is the next step for you, you know, and how are you going to apply this to the work that you do as a professional? Thank you, good question. Um, so one of the things is obviously Education is power too. Um, so I've already applied for my master's program with CUNY and developmental psychology. So I can further gain more knowledge and utilize those tools to go into higher education. Um, like I said, I just switched from working with affluent families who are paying $3,000 a month for early childhood experiences. Now I'm back to working in East New York, Brooklyn, um, which is a high needs, low income community with prom prominently um, black and brown families. So there, I just took on a role as a behavioral specialist. Um, and I just spoke to my supervisor a few weeks ago about, you know, like just all of the trauma that people of color deal with or they have to see on the news. Now everything is like in your face, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, right? All of this stuff. Um, so I actually just started a meditation group, which will commence in January. So it'll teach young children how to deal and combat trauma and stress through breathing exercises, yoga, things of that nature um, when they're feeling overwhelmed. So that's another tidbit. Um, and then also I'm so interested in going back to South Africa. So I've been twice. I'm gonna have a local partnership with the school there. Um, so when they were supposed to reach day zero in 2018 with limited access to water, I actually um, raised money to help build um, like huge filters essentially connected to their school so that they'll never have to worry about running out of water. Um, I've also taught there, I have friends there. So I also wanna go back. I'm interested to see um, the experience in South Africa compared to the experience in the States, kind of marrying those two, seeing what those look like um, and the similarities between the inequalities, which is real too with apartheid in South Africa, which is still very dominant. Um, so I have a lot of, different ideas buzzing through my head, but I know that this is definitely um, a turning point for me. So I'm grateful for the opportunity and the fight definitely doesn't stop here.